My mom was in the hospital 42 days, my sister 35, and uh, my sister passed first. Jeez. Six days later, my mom passed. I don't know that I've grieved it at all. I've, I've been sad. I've cried more times than I could possibly count. Woo! What's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. The greatest show you could possibly be listening to. There's a billion and a half podcast, and this is the best use of your time. It's the greatest mental health and marriage and parenting podcast that has ever existed. And I'm so glad that you're with us. Um, And I'm just taking a cue from politics. And if I just keep saying it, it becomes true all of a sudden. I like, I like, uh, what's the thing to say nowadays? It's my truth, (laughs) right? As though that's a thing. It's my truth. Hey, um, if you want to be on the show, give me a buzz. 1-844-693-3291. And um, give me a call, leave a message, and Jenna will give you a call back, and we'll talk through what's going on in your life. And uh, we'll have you on the show. Can't wait. Or you can go to johndeloney.com slash ask. And thank you, thank you, thank you. The five-star reviews are starting to pour in. In fact, the guy here at Ramsey Solutions where I work who's over podcast said, what happened? We just got an onslaught of reviews and subscribers. So thank you so much. This just sends the show out to so many other people um, so they can get the help they need. You know, they may not even get help. They just, you know, it's just good to feel like you're not the only one going through some of this stuff, right? You're you're not crazy. So thank you so much for the reviews. Please just hit the subscribe button. It's very, very simple, and it really helps us out. Um, hey, this is super rad. Kelly handed me this. Um, came out a few weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago. The, the The headline is "Lonely 67 Year Old Sets Up Woodworking Shed to Combat Loneliness in Men Following a Global Trend." says, across the English-speaking world, men are learning that the easiest way to cure a bout of social isolation is not by talking face-to-face, but shoulder-to-shoulder. Philip Jackson moved back to England from Australia. He was 67 and felt like a stray dog in his native town. And so he got a shed and started um, inviting men and women uh, over to do woodworking together. It's about plugging into the social fabric of a community, whether that's through meeting up for coffee, building a park bench, or listening to to the problems someone is going through in their marriage. It's a break from people's weekly routines. In 2005, there's an estimated 200 men's sheds operating in Australia. And today, there is a membership base of over 1,200, 1,200 men's sheds. And uh, you can... Even the Ministry for Health and Aged Care have started offering 10 grand for people, and this is in Australia, to kick these things up and get them going. Um, there are 17 U.S. men's sheds. Way to go, America, including one in Hawaii. Let's let's get more of these up. Um, I was just talking to my friend, Gwen. We're going to start playing guitar together here up at the office. In fact, I even traded um, an old gun for a, a guitar case. How's that for liberal propaganda? I traded a gun for an old guitar. I mean, for not a guitar case, for an old amplifier, a small one that I can bring up here and leave at the office. And me and my buddies are going to start jamming up here. I figure I've played for about 35 years. I should be better <laughs> anyway. So I'm going to start taking lessons. I'm going to learn. And it's just going to be some guys hanging out, playing guitar together, which is going to be good for us. It's going to be good for our, our, our families. It's going to be good for our communities. Um, Here's the deal. It's not really a woodworking shop. Jackson says it's a community enterprise where people with problems can come and discuss them with friends. Um, For Americans who feel a woodworking support group would be welcome in their community, the U.S. Men's Shed Association. There's an association for everybody. The U.S. Men's Shed Association. Sounds like a Garth Brooks song. Has plenty of resources for those looking to start their own shed, including a step-by-step process for getting a 501c3 nonprofit status, applying for grants from healthcare and other funding sources to launch a program, even ideas for your first meeting. Here's the deal. Do something. Do something. When people ask me, um, hey, how do I make friends? How do I get connected? Go first. Go first. Go first. And you know what's going to happen? There's going to be some weirdos that show up. There for sure are. And some folks with crazy problems and you have to say i don't i don't know what you're talking about you need to go see a counselor um hey will you pass the miter saw please like 
it's a matter of just getting in community together because there's going to be a group of people that you connect with that end up becoming a ride or dies if you will just go first. So good, good on this guy, good on this guy and good to the 17 folks in America who've started up these men's sheds. And I hope to see a whole, whole bunch more. Um, local YMCA's, local churches, local community leaders. Let's get it going. Just, I don't care what the group is. Let's just start getting people together and um, finding things we can do uh, with one another. All right, let's go to Kristen in, man, we have been living in Seattle lately, man. Home of the grunge movement. What's up, Kristen? How we doing? Good, how are you? Good. Are you just thinking about Pearl Jam and Nirvana this morning? Is that what you do in Seattle when you wake up? It's just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. No, I, I'm not the <laughs> typical Seattle person for you. <laughs> that was, that's my favorite answer of the day. Are you just waking up thinking of Pearl Jam and Nirvana and you just go, no, no. Uh, no. <laughs> that's no. so great, Kristen. What do you I, do? I, I do have to say I love the men's shed thing. I, I think there is something to say about creating a space where people can do things while they open up and talk because I think it's so not intimidating, and I think more of that needs to be happening. I agree. I, there's something about um, – doing something with somebody that makes it easier to have a conversation than it does just putting your hands in your lap and staring at somebody and, yep. and them saying, tell me what's wrong with your life. And on that note, Kristen, tell me what's wrong with your life. <laughs> Let's just make this uh, as so weird as possible. Question. All right. What's up? No, that's okay. Um, I have, I have three teenagers, um, ages 13, 16 and 18. And my question is, um, I'm also, I've been divorced for five years. And so I understand my kids are best served if they have healthy relationships with both their dad and myself. So how do I support and facilitate if I am able to them having a positive relationship with their dad while at the same time helping them understand what healthy relationship boundaries look like when he's probably not a healthy relationship and he's making choices that don't create a healthy relationship. You, <laughs> you just said that in the most eloquently evasive way <laughs> I've heard in a long time. <laughs> like you were very gifted at that. Um, like I could get off the phone now and feel really good. And if someone's like, what did she say? I would go, I don't know. But it just sounded so nice. So let's get to the nitty gritty. Um, Here's what I think I heard. You got divorced five years ago, and I'm just going to throw it out there. You may say you're an idiot. You still aren't a super fan of the divorce. And your husband is not being the dad that you envisioned him being as a co-parent. And your kids are struggling. A hundred percent. I, I chose the divorce. Okay. I don't regret it. However, I am brokenhearted every single day there you go. that I wrote a chapter of my kid's life for them that they are now stuck with. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he is doing a terrible job of parenting. Hey, there we go. Thank you. That's, <laughs> thank you for speaking English. That, now I'm talking. Yeah. He sucks. Um, okay. All right. Um, and I'm, I'm doing my best. I have, um, I've encouraged them to have conversations with him to Mm -hmm. identify the problem, help him figure out like, can they're missing out on quality time. He doesn't make time for them. So can you suggest, can we go for a walk, dad? Can we go for ice cream? Can we have a movie night? I've met with his new wife. We've had a conversation. I've met with a pastor in the church that he respects about how to encourage a healthy relationship with his kids. There's nothing I've done that it's helped him make changes he needs to have good relationships with his kids. And I don't know how to handle it as a supportive co-parent on my behalf. You have to open up your hands and let that go. Because that's your Mm. your fantasy, not his. And I hate that for you. Mike, there's, there's, there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. He is making a choice to not be involved in his kid's life. And that's going to be his cross to, to carry for a long, long time. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning of the call, the best thing for them, you're exactly right, is two adults who lean in and love their kids. Um, your kids aren't going to get the best. Mm-hmm. And it's making peace with that. You, you waking up every day and choosing to live brokenhearted 
is adding more bricks to their backpacks that they don't need to carry. Why do you, you, you regret this? You say you don't regret it. I, I disagree with you. What, what is the baggage you're still carrying? Do you wish y'all had worked it out? Do you wish you'd stuck it out? Like, what are you hanging on to? Or you just wish that you hadn't have put your, like, what, what is it that you're upset with yourself over? Um, that I created a divorced home for my kids. I, Why I was did, in the marriage for 17 years. Uh-huh. It was very um, lonely. There was never any emotional intimacy. There was never a friendship. It was very much me raising four kids Mm -hmm. on my own, basically being a single parent in that marriage. Um, I do not regret leaving the relationship. Mm -hmm. I regret the heartache a divorced home creates for my kids. Did you also regret the heartache that a lonely, isolated spouse creates? Did you also lament the the heartache that your kids are going to have to carry watching their dad act like a a grown-up child and forcing mom into a parental role instead of a partnership role like you you made a choice a relational choice because you couldn't survive anymore Mm -hmm. and yes that choice comes with consequences no no mistaking that but choosing something else would have come with consequences potentially more extreme ones because your kids would have grown up in a home so filled with tension and so filled with angst and so filled with rage that they would have spent all of their time wondering what was wrong with them because they felt insane. At least now they have something to mm-hmm. point at, right? Yeah. And they've got a mom that loves them like crazy. Fair? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so the story of their dad is unfolding in front of them. And we don't want this. You don't, I mean, this isn't something you would cheer for or hope for. But there will come a moment when your kids, if they haven't already, go, oh, okay. Oh, they're there. (laughs) Okay, right? And here's where that's dangerous for a kid is, you probably heard me say this before, but they know that half of them is that guy. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. what if that turns out to be me? What is so bad about me? Why why would my dad choose fill in the blank other than their kid? Like, they're searching for answers that have logical conclusion. I mean, they're, they're asking questions that have logical answers and they're not being met with logical responses. And it's just un, unnerving. And the best you can do is love them like crazy. And we, t- we talk about that a lot because I've, I've heard you say that quite often. And especially my 18-year-old, he doesn't see his dad and he doesn't talk to his dad anymore. Okay. And he has said multiple times, I never want to be like him or I'm going to make sticky notes and put them up on my bathroom mirror. When I have my own place, it says, do not be your dad. Okay. Here's, Um, here's where mom, you can really help out because what that's telling him is half of me is dysfunctional and broken. mm -hmm. And so I think it's hard, but it's important to say, yeah, there's some things that I wish your dad was doing differently. I wish he's got, Mm -hmm. I wish he got to see what an awesome son you are. Like I get to see. And Mm -hmm. your dad is really charming and love and funny and he can be really engaging and he's got some good qualities too. And by lifting up the good parts of your ex-husband, you're lifting up your Mm -hmm. son. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard because it's easy to just burn the whole guy to the ground, but you're burning your son to the ground too when that happens. No, and and I think it's trying to find... (laughs) Um, those few good qualities yes. um, and pointing them out and, you know, saying he has a really good work ethic and he passed that on to you. And I see that in you. And yes. so you have that really positive thing. Yes, your dad. yes, 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 yes. And, and the things that you might see in yourself that you don't like that are like myself or your dad that you take on simply because it's what you are modeled. Mm-hmm. You're, you're capable of changing those things too. Oh, dude. You're not a prisoner to so what you've good. been modeled and who your parents are. So good. I, I, ah. You're in a season of discomfort. And so I almost mm-hmm. hesitate to tell you this, but you're doing it exactly right. Thank you. You're doing exactly right. Um, you're making the best of a very messy situation. And I would, if I'm in your seat, like the best I can tell you is if I'm sitting in your seat and my wife had left me and it's five years later and she's, remarried and moved on with her life and suddenly she doesn't want anything to do with the kids. 
I would open my hands up and not try to direct her behaviors. I would try to use that extra energy and love my kids. I would use that extra energy and love myself enough to make sure I'm well, that I'm taking care of business, that I've got new relationships. Um, You can't take away your kids' questions about what they did to divide up the home. You can't take away your kids' questions about why their dad doesn't want to spend time with them. That doesn't make any sense to them. Um, You can assure them there's not a way they can act their way into their dad's heart. That right now he's making some different decisions and it is, it is, it stinks. But they're lovely and they're loved and they're good kids. I would have your kids write your dad, uh, their dad letters. Maybe make that a weekly exercise. And what that will do for your kids is it helps them begin to laser in on what they miss. It really helps them come up with some poignant questions and it keeps the thoughts and feelings and emotions from overwhelming a 13 or 18 or 16 year old mind and body. And so every week, dad won't talk to him. Dad doesn't want to visit with him. Cool. We're going to write dad a letter. And then they're going to give them to you, and you may not send those letters. You may just hang on to them because this is going to be an exercise for the home. Um, It's going to be an exercise. Maybe they read them out loud to you, and they will be heartbreaking. Or maybe they're super fun, or maybe they're a mixture of both, but it gives your kids an outlet. It gives their bodies the opportunity to speak to their dad when their dad just won't speak to them. So that's just an idea. Um, Maybe it's a a once-a-month thing. Um, It will be a painful exercise, but it's an exercise I think over time will really benefit. Um, And I'll just say this. I know this goes without saying, but parents, if you get divorced, you get divorced. Parents do, uh, adults do adult things. Show up for your kids. Show up for your kids. We'll be right back. Hey, Deloney here, and I've got a word from our sponsor from BetterHelp. I've been on the giving and receiving end of therapy for years. When I was spinning out like a decade ago with wild anxiety, I had a moment, that light bulb moment that I knew I had to do something different. I knew I had to change something, probably a lot of some things, right? But I found myself without the tools for taking the next step. And when you're facing problems or challenges in life, it's way too easy to get stuck in that anxious spiral of doom. I've been there. But when you learn how to stop that cycle and start taking ownership of your life, that's when you're free. And that's what therapy can help you do. It gives you the tools you need to do the problem solving in your own life. And that's why I love BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. It's more affordable than in-person therapy. Plus, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. If you're ready to get the tools that you need to deal with the curveballs life's thrown at you, therapy can help. Visit betterhelp.com slash Deloney to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash Deloney. All right, we're back. Let's go to Andrew in Dayton, Ohio. What's up, Andrew? Hey, what's going on, Dr. John? How are you, sir? Partying, my brother. What's up? Oh, uh, here's, I'm just going to cut to it. Uh, how do I grieve? Well, that's, a, that's an open-ended, broad question. What do you want to grieve, man? Yeah, everything. Um, let's, uh, let's go back. Um, year ago, my mom got sick and, uh, she went in the hospital about six days later. My sister, my baby sister got sick. What'd they get she sick? what the they get sick with? COVID. Okay. And, um, my mom was in the hospital 42 days, my sister 35. Um, and, uh, my sister passed first. Oh, geez. And it, it'll be a year coming up this week. And then um, my sister had special needs. Mm-hmm. So the she was, she was on a respirator and all the machines that they hook her up to. And basically, um, the doctor wouldn't pull her off the machine that wasn't doing anything but keeping her heartbeat until we told our mom. 
and asked her permission to take her off the machine, even though my mom was incapacitated. And so we told her because, you know, it, it was the right thing to do. And um, six days later, my mom passed. Yeah. And, and, I, and I know it was related to finding out that she'd lost a child. Hmm. Not, no doubt in my mind. And so coming up on a year, and I just, I, I don't know that I've grieved it at all. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been sad. I've, I've, I've cried more times than I could possibly count. I've lost hours of sleep every night. Mm-hmm. Um, it's created all sorts of other health problems, yep. which is telling me I'm not doing something right. No, it's not. And it's not. Hey, it's not. It's not. Andrew, I, I think you have, you have grieved it. You are grieving it. This is what grief is. It's crying at the weirdest moments. It's waking up in the middle of the night. It's throwing up. It's feeling sick. It's looking at like, if you have like a whoop strap, it's looking at it and like you're at 25% recovery for four months. It's like your body shuts itself off because it can't. It, it it's, it's so overwhelming. This is grief, man. And it's awful. But, but then how do, I, how do I work through it? Because it's not something... I mean, I've lost people before. Um, hey, dude, bro, ago, my, not your mom, man, not your mom, yeah. not your special needs sister that you've been defending since the day she was born. Hmm. Like you had a purpose and your purpose was your sister. And in 30 days it went away and you've got your mom, dude, that's a whole other level. That's not like losing a friend or losing a buddy or losing a grandparent. That's your mother. I've sat with people who are 63 years old who lose their 80-something-year-old parents and they just unspool because it's their mom. It's their dad. You know what I mean? This is different. And you're coming up on an anniversary moment and for whatever reason, I, I don't know the physiology of it or the biology of it, but I know that anniversary markers, our bodies tend to just ramp it up. They just turn the heat up on us. And things get a little bit sharper, a little bit lower, a little bit darker. And in your case, we're ending, we're heading off into the winter season. So things are getting grayer and colder and it just all works together to say, screw the world, right? Yeah. yeah. And can I be honest? Um, and I, for those listening, I don't want to hear any of your political nonsense. I got a friend who's hurting here. Um, but when you lose your mom and your sister and then a politician gets up and says, this never counted, this wasn't ever real, or it's all over now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're still holding, you know, you can look over and see your sister's jacket hanging on the hook. Or when your buddies yeah. roll their eyes and the next politician gets up and it's like, I'm running for office and say this stupid. And it's like, well, I lost my mom and I lost my sister. You know what I mean? So there's an extra, I'm, I'm hearing across the country especially with COVID losses, there's an extra dose of hurt on top of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because it's because my mom, like it's the story of my mom. It's the story of my sister. And suddenly it's turned into a caricature or a drama or a political move. Dude, it's my mom. Yeah, right. And so there's all sorts of stuff on top of this. Um, here's the best way I can, the, the best picture I've seen of grief when your mom passed away and your sister passed away they cast a long shadow over you and you're sitting in that shadow and you can see it laid out as though you're standing in the shadow of a large tree okay that shadow length and size will always be that that big you lost your mom what you can't see now is that you will continue to grow and in one year five years 10 years 15 years you will be so far out beyond that shadow. The shadow is still the same size, but you will have developed and grown and created a new life. There will be seasons when you find yourself knocked down, sitting up against that tree in that shadow, and it cast over you again. And that might be on the five-year anniversary or the 10-year anniversary. You hear a song or you see a special needs kid that reminds you of your little sister mm. and your body just yanks you back into it. It's cool, man. It's cool. 
But what you can't see on this side of it is your growth. I would tell you not to fight it right now, man. You're a year in. I would spend here. here let, me, let me just say what I would do if I was you. Is that, is that a fair way to approach this? Absolutely. Um, I would sit down and write mom a letter and I would sit down and write sister a letter. And if you're really brave, I'd find some way to read those letters too. Whether if you have a sister or a sibling or you're married or something like that, I would read that out loud. And in that letter, there's usually three parts. One of them is how pissed off I am that you left me. How mad I am that you're gone. Whether that's mad at them, mad, mad at God, mad at the doctors, mad at whoever. Another one is, I'm just so sad. I miss you. Here's what it feels like now that you're gone. And then the third part of that letter is, here's what you've missed. I got a new job. I got a promotion. I'm letting my hair grow long. I've gained 48 pounds, right? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> like, like the Astros are going to win the World Series again, right? That's me casting that. Oh, I hope it. not. <laughs> I hope not. Right? So it's, it's, here's what you've missed. And here's, here's why that's important. When we transition to here's what you've missed, we are slowly teaching our bodies and our minds that it's happened. There's a period at the end of the sentence and life is continuing to move. And over time, you write letters about what you've missed, how much I miss you. And those letters will get more and more infrequent and they'll get um, shorter and you'll find yourself laughing again. And then you're going to find yourself, you, have you already done this? Where you find yourself just laughing your butt off, dude. Like you've something so funny and it's usually super profane. Like you wouldn't say it in front of your mom, but you're laughing and then you feel guilty for having joy, for yeah. laughing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Notice when you feel guilty laughing. Notice when you feel guilty after sex. Notice when you feel guilty about some of these pleasurable moments in life that suddenly you think, wait a minute, I shouldn't be having pleasure because I'm still, because they died, right? And don't beat yourself up over it, but just notice it and then exhale and say, no, I'm allowed to smile. My mom would want me to be having a good time. My sister would want me to smile. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I struggle with the different roles I have to carry right now. Um, what roles? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a husband. Okay. I'm a dad. Okay. Um, I've got uh, two other biological sisters and then an adopted special needs sister. Okay. And then I've got my dad. And then my mom's mom is still alive. So I feel the burden of responsibility to help her because that was mom's role. And it's... I mean, it's just challenging. It's, it's overwhelming sometimes. Here's, and, let, and, I want to flip the whole thing over, okay? Okay. You can only do that type of heavy lifting if Andrew comes first. If Andrew's physical health comes first, you're sleeping and you're eating right, you're moving your body, you're exercising a couple times a week, you have some friends that you're talking to, you get buddies together once a week and you'll go to, throw darts or you go, I don't know, build something, play guitar, whatever it is, but you um, get a group together. Only then you go to church, you go back, you get reconnected with a faith community, whatever that looks like for you. Only then are you reinforced enough to then be the dad that your kids need. And by the way, hopefully you've told your kids how sad you are. Oh, absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Good. Don't rob them of this moment of watching. Here's what a man who loves his daughter feels and is going through. Don't take that from him. Okay. Be honest with them. Otherwise they're going to feel your angst and they're going to feel your distance and they're going to blame themselves for it. Give, give that gift to them to let them watch. No, you I tell grief. them, I tell them all the time. Good. Um, I, I get, I mean, my kids are 12 and 10. Perfect. And so they're, they're at that age of understanding mm -hmm. and all of the things that they have to process through. Um, you know, we tried to protect them when we were in the hospital mm -hmm. where they were in the hospital. Um, I was driving an hour every day to go see them mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to keep, keep them from all of the information. And, um, we, we learned afterwards that that was probably not the best way to do that. Sure. So here and, we are. So and, you're doing a good job of, of communicating now, right? Yeah, we're we're right. on it now. We we, right. we learned the hard way. Good, 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 um, but, good, good. And so, 
Can I say something hard, man? Please. I'll say something good, something good, and then I'll say something hard, okay? Whenever we lose somebody that we love, especially they were hurting as badly as your sister and your mom are hurting, um, the ventilator passing is, is brutal. You saw it firsthand, right? Yeah, yeah. One of my jobs when I did crisis response was if somebody had like, let's say they'd lost a kid. Say a kid had died by suicide and mom was coming home and she was coming to the house. My job was actually to meet mom in the foyer of that home or in the front yard and not let mom come back and see the kid. Mm. And wow. here's why. Because here was my standard line that I always gave and it wasn't a line, it was the truth. You don't want this to be the last picture of your son or daughter in your mind. You want that last picture, the time y'all hugged when he left your house, that time at Thanksgiving when you were throwing marshmallows at each other. You don't want this last picture because it freeze frames in your mind. And here's what we miss. They're not hurting anymore. Huh. Okay. The last time you saw your sister, she was in hell. The last time you saw your mom, you watched her dissolve, like just dissipate in front of you. And listen, brother, they're not hurting anymore. Okay. Yeah. And it's making peace with, oh yeah, they're finally free. They are free, free, free. And it's sitting in that for a minute. Because right now your body is still trying to make sure everything's okay with them on the ventilator. They're not there anymore. Here's the hard thing. My brother, they're gone. And no amount of work or trying to cobble together more things to throw on your shoulders is going to make their life any more okay. They're gone. Yeah. And it's being able to open your hands up and for the first time in a year, drop your shoulders down. Tell your sisters, I need some help. Tell your dad, how are you, man? I can help you, but I can't, I can't carry you. See the difference yeah, there? Um, I, I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have my good days. Of course you do. Bro, you're not broken. Hey, you are not broken. You're not malfunctioning. You're a, you're yeah. a, you're a son who loved his mom and you're a, dope brother who loved his sister that's what you are and that means so how do I, it hurts so how do i handle so when these moments hit mm -hmm. and and uh being perfectly honest you're the first person i've talked to in a year outside of close friends okay so i feel like i need more help than what i'm getting but okay. how do i handle the those moments where i'm wrestling with the regret you know, the, the missed Thanksgiving, the, the time I blew my mom off to go hang with my buddies, you know, whatever the story may be in those moments come up and then they're just crushing sometimes. That's right. That's right. And so there's, there's two ways to move forward from this. Number one is when those thoughts pop into your mind, understand you have a choice. You have a choice to meditate on that lightning bolt that pops in. Remember that time you blew mom off for a text message and literally say out loud, not doing that. Hmm. Not doing it. That's your brain trying to meditate on the things, on the negativity so that it can prevent hurt in the future. And it doesn't prevent hurt in the future. It's just your brain trying to do the best it can because it's got a very primitive operating system on it that says, look, bear, run from bear, watch out for bears. Right. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. so those lightning bolts pop into your mind when you're walking down the street. And you remember that time you snapped at your special needs sister because she was driving you crazy. And you go, nope. And here's the key. Here's the second key. You have an immediate thought to replace that with a time you okay. and your little sister laughed so hard. You thought you were going to both vomit on each other. <laughs> that time you and your mom got into a donut eating contest and you saw that nine-year-old girl come out of her in a weird way or the time your mom cussed at you and it just slipped out and you laughed, <laughs> right? Let's go to that. And here's what will happen in short order. If you will do that work because you weren't a bad son, you're a human being. If you will do that work in a shorter amount of time than you think, your body will change the default setting to every time you think of them, they will be filled with light and joy, not, oh my God, they just died. 
Okay. Okay. It is saying, nope, not doing it. I'm not going to meditate on the negative. I remember that time mom, fill in the blank, did something hilarious. Or I'm calling dad. I'm calling dad, see how he's doing. And here's the other big boy thing you got to do. You got to sit down with your wife in the next 48 hours, okay? And tell her, I have not been honest with you for a year. I've tried to be tough. I've tried to carry all this. I felt a ton of responsibility and I'm heartbroken because I miss my sister. And I'm heartbroken because I miss my mom. And there's going to be moments in the next six months while I'm healing that I'm not going to be able to carry it all. And I'm going to ask you, I may lean over and say, hey, I need some help today. And that would be one of the greatest gifts you give your wife. Because she's been feeling insane and helpless sitting on her own hands the last year. And finally, her husband's going to say, I'm not Superman. I'm calling reality as it is. Can I get some help? And she's going to say, God, yes, I'm ready for you. Is that fair? That's absolutely fair because I think she would – she's been the one telling me to get some help. That's right. Because um, she – here's why. She feels you not sleeping and she feels you sitting at the kitchen table four feet from – I mean four inches from her and 4,000 miles away from her. She yeah. feels it and she doesn't know how to bridge that gap. And so she's asking you to walk across it. And if you sat down and had that moment of vulnerability tonight, cancel whatever plans you got tonight and take her out to dinner and just say, I haven't been honest with you. I've been trying to carry all this myself and I'm sorry. I need some, I, I need you to pick up some slack for a season. Oh my gosh, what a gift that would be for your home, my brother. What a gift. Um, I'll say it one more time. You're not broken, man. You're just in it. Um, do sit down and write your mom that letter. Do sit down and write your sister that letter. Read it to your wife if you can. Read it to your sisters if you can. Have them write letters and y'all can get together for the one year anniversary of their passing and have another celebration slash day of mourning. Let your kids hear those letters. Bring people into this and you you will begin to grow and stand beyond this shadow. That's my promise, my brother. Hang on the line. I'm going to send you a copy of Own Your Past, Change Your Future. You've, you, you've been through it and now we're going to ask ourselves, what do we do next? And I got you. Thanks for calling, my brother. We'll be right back. Hey guys, Deloney here, and I've got a word from our sponsor, Whoop. If you've listened to the show for any length of time, you know I'm a major nerd about fitness, sleep, mental health, and building healthier life habits. And let's just say this, Whoop makes my nerd heart so happy. One reason I love Whoop is that it's not like all the other fitness trackers that mix in a watch and laser lights and smiley faces and a million notifications and reminders that you you need to get your steps in. No, Whoop is a fitness wearable that actually looks cool and it's comfortable and it gives you data that really matters. It breaks down your recovery, your sleep, and your daily strain into a format that's easy to interpret. And some days I wake up in the green and this tells me that I'm ready to go attack the day. And other days I wake up in the red and I know that I got to take it easy and I can look back in time and see how I got there. If you're working to be intentional and build healthier habits, Whoop can help you get there. Start keeping an eye on your health and wellness at a deeper level. Go to whoop.com, that's W-H-O-O-P.com, and use promo code Deloney to get 10% off your order today. All right, we're going out to Cassie in Cambridge, where they got equations on the walls at the bars. What's up, Cassie? Hi, Dr. John. Are you an MIT kid or a Harvard kid? A Harvard kid. No, none of those. <laughs> I just, I wish I was, but no. I'm not, hey, I'm not either. I'm a state school guy. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, what's Me up, too. Cassie? All right. Um, so I guess my question here is, it sounds weird, but I have. <laughs> have you ever, year. have you ever heard this show? <laughs> oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah it's all, I promise whatever you're about to say, you're not the weird one. So <laughs> bring it on. Okay. Um, so I, I have this fear of going, basically going to the doctors. Um, and it's like super strange, but I will like, I'll cancel appointments and I'll miss appointments because of it. And I don't know, like, I don't know if this is something, if there's something I can do before it, or if I need to deal with something, um, or if it's just normal, I guess. Why are you scared to go to the doctor? Why does your body tell you we don't need to go there? Uh, um, well, I, 
I guess I, I had a bad, like pretty bad experiences in the past. And tell, tell me about them. Yeah. Um, so I, I was in elementary school and I think part of it is. Because, Just like, tell, I, me, I, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell <laughs> me. Okay. Um, when I was in elementary school, I struggled with food and just stuff like that. And I ended up Cassie, being hospitalized. Cassie. Like, yes. Say it all the way. Well, I was hospitalized and then for they, what? For what? For what? This is what I like. I can't, I can talk about it, but I can't name it. So I, I don't know. Okay, so you had a challenge with food. Did you were you struggling with anorexia or bulimia? Uh, yeah, one of those. Yeah. Okay. Why can't you say that? I don't know. Like, will you say it right um, now? Maybe. Go for it. I struggled with some. Eating issues. Okay. And it led to me being hospitalized for a couple of weeks. And then I was thrown into a, basically a psych ward. But mm -hmm. um, I just had like a really a rough experience in there. Um, it was a teenage unit and I was 12 at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was a good eating issues mm -hmm. when I was younger. So I just saw like, so many different things um, in there. And it was a really, I guess, a really scary, scary experience. What was, um, thank you for saying that out loud, by the way. I know it was hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, why were you a goody two shoe? <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm going I'm to ask that, I'm gonna ask that in a hard, direct <laughs> way. Is that cool? Yeah. Often, goody two shoes can be a trauma response. It's a way to keep mm -hmm. the boogeyman away. It's a way to keep a scary uncle or a mom and dad from being on your case, from messing with you. If you just do everything perfect and toe the line and stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, what I'm, I always did? I did well in school. I just wanted. Of course, you did. I like. I like to do well. Yeah. Okay. Where did the, what were the roots in disordered eating? Um, what was that a response to? I, I wish, I wish I knew that because okay. I, I don't know. I felt like I was so young that mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Okay. And there, I, I've, I've recently in the past year heard some studies that suggests that may be a, more genetic than we previously thought. We used to subscribe, like prescribe it all to traumas and anxiety response and that there is some, some significant literature that suggests that has, can be highly genetic, that there's really not a lot of environmental factors, but I don't know enough about it. Um, here's what's important now. Are you healed now? Are you, are you, do you have a good relationship with food now? I would say, yeah, for the most part, I feel Good. Good. Do you still struggle from anorexia or bulimia? Uh, not really. Only when times are tough, but okay. no, not really. Okay. <laughs> times have been tough for everybody recently, <laughs> Cassie. Yeah. So why do you need A to little. go to the doctor? For it, it's um, it's kind of a regular a regular checkup or follow up. Um, I had a major like health scare earlier this year, and. It, was wasn't, it? I don't, um, it wasn't related. Well, I don't know if it was or wasn't related. I They say it wasn't, but I always feel super guilty that I caused the issue. Um, What's the issue? So I, I basically, I had um, a growth in my body um, that required surgery, but I guess I'm... Like this is my kind of my fault because I waited until the growth became massive until I went to the doctors um, to get it checked out. I don't. You and I could spend some time together. <laughs> I know, but you don't like Cassie. 
And I don't like that you don't like Cassie because I like Cassie. Yeah. And I you, like, I think, I think I like her. I, you are pleasant with her, but you think she does a lot of stuff wrong. I think some, she could be better in some ways. Yeah. Wanting to improve on things is one thing. Be better is a totally different proposition. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. So here's like the last couple of times, or there's been a couple of times in your life that you've gone to the doctor. One of them has mm -hmm. ended in a surgery that you have shame over. Another time ended up in a hospitalization and you probably heard it from your parents about how expensive it was and how they had to, one of them had to quit their job and they had to, right? It caused a major um, upheaval in your home that somehow was transferred onto you. This is your fault. Not mm -hmm. we're your parents and we love you and it's our job to take care of you to the ends of the earth. That's what we signed up for when we had you. But if you'd, you're fine. Just eat or just, just like, right. Those kind mm -hmm. of things. Yes, and yeah. here you are now and you need to go to the doctor and your body's put some GPS pins in the doctor's offices as though they are the problem. And I'd love mm -hmm. to reframe that and say, no, um, you had some scary experiences as a kid. And it probably wasn't a good idea for you. It wasn't a good idea for a 12-year-old to be put on the on a psych ward with teenagers. Mm. The number of students over the years that I, I sat with in psych wards that were like, oh, I thought I wasn't okay. But whoa, after spending two nights in a psych ward, they're like, I'm fine, <laughs> right? I'm, I don't have that. Um, is, I, I mean, all but like a handful had that experience. And I can only imagine how terrifying that was for a 12-year-old, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The phobia is real. This fear is real. And there is one way to heal from it. And it's to go right through it. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I know that's the worst possible answer you can get. <laughs> you can get. Here's um, what I have found in my life. Um is you have to teach your body that it's okay to go now. It wasn't then, it's okay now. That's what healing from trauma is. I can walk in and I can feel my heart rate getting up. I can feel my hands. I can feel myself picking up my phone to cancel and I'm not going to. I'm gonna feel it. And what we're gonna do over the course of a few um, visits is we're gonna retrain our body that doctors are trustworthy and they're okay. And that if I do have to have surgery, thank goodness there's a group of people who's dedicated their lives to keeping people like me safe. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a total reframe from, oh God, if I go there, they're going to cut another big lump of my body out of me. <laughs> it's, man, thank goodness they are, are, are keeping me safe. And I'm going to feel it and I'm going to feel it and I'm going to feel it. And here's the other thing. Disordered eating has a way of isolating us creating a space between us and relationships and us and the rest of the world. Fair? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I've struggled with disordered eating almost my entire life. Okay. And I only recently started talking about that publicly. It's been a mess. Uh -huh. Okay. I tell you that to tell you, I can be in a crowded room completely by myself because I am so preoccupied with judging how I look and how I'm standing and how I'm moving. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The only way through that is to open up to other people. And now I come out of my room and I look at my wife and say, is this shirt okay to wear? And she says, yes. And I let, I trust her more than my feelings. And I'm learning, I'm in the process right now in my forties of learning how to trust and how to feel what a shirt feels like that fits. That doesn't feel awkward that, you know what I mean? That's where you yeah. are. And we're going to practice practice relationships. So I have found walking through anxiety, walking through phobias, walking through those moments, I can only do it with somebody else with me by my side. Okay. Okay. And so it's making an appointment to go to the doctor and calling a friend and saying, I need you to come here and 
um, set up an appointment for me. Or I need you to call and make an appointment for me on the first two or three while I'm learning. And that way I can't call and cancel them. Only you can. Mm -hmm. And then I need you to come pick me up because I'm not going to get in the car. That's actually a good idea. <laughs> we're just Here's what we're doing. We're owning reality. And reality is right now, um, I can't stop eating sugar. I'm just throwing that out there. So I'm going to take all the sugar out of my house. I can't right now. And you can, but it feels like you can't. I can't make a good choice when it comes to seeing a doctor because every time I make an appointment, my whole body freezes on me and tenses up because the last few times I've gone, it's been a disaster, both financially and physically. So, hey, I need you to make this appointment for me or do it with me. And then I need you to drive me. Would you come pick me up? Would you walk alongside me during this during this time? Would you be in the in the room with me? Would you sit in there with me um, while the doctor gives me the news? Um, I'd really appreciate that. And then our bodies are going to see that we are not alone. Our bodies are going to see that that doctor's got our best interest at heart. Our body's going to see that we're more well after we visit our doctor than before. And then it's going to learn over time. Oh, Cassie's driving now. Cassie's in control. Doctors aren't the end of the world. I had a bad experience, a real bad experience once. And they saved my life the next time. They're for me, not against me. And we're just teaching our body that. You're brave, brave young woman. I would also recommend find a local counselor in your area and let them know. I really struggle with some historical trauma here. I don't know where it's from. I don't know why. Um, I still struggle with disordered eating every once in a while. When things get stressed, and things are always stressed. And I want some practical tips on breathing through and box breathing and whew, dropping my shoulders when I've got to do hard things like make doctor's appointments and actually show up, make counseling appointments and actually show up. Because we can't do life by ourselves, Cassie. We can't. Got to have other people, professionals and friends, moms and dads and romantic partners. We need everybody. We'll be right back. It seems so easy, but most of us way undervalue real, genuine relationships. Our friendships, our marriages, we don't know what we're doing. And instead of diving into the mess, we accept shallowness and distraction and we wallpaper over our loneliness. So let me say this boldly. You cannot be well alone. You've got to get connected to real life people and have deep, powerful relationships. I'm talking about relationships where you can be honest where you can open up, where you can share hard things, and you each know that you'll still show up for each other. And in my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, we'll walk through a not-so-complicated approach to relationships, mental health, and wellness, and getting connected is a key part of that. That's why you'll learn shallowness and loneliness are so dangerous, and more importantly, you'll learn how to create meaningful relationships in your life moving forward. There is no good app to help adults find friendships, but this book can help. Go to johndeloney.com to take the next step towards wellness. That's own your past, change your future at johndeloney.com. All right, we're back as we wrap up today's show. Hey, um, don't forget the brand new questions for humans cards are out. Um, get online and go get those. Save your holiday season. Spark some romance. Reconnect with your kids or your adult parents your aging parents. The tools are for you. Today's song of the day is a shout out to all these Seattle callers from one of the OGs, the Stone Temple Pilots. The song's called the Interstate Love Song. It goes like this. Waiting on a Sunday afternoon for what I've read between the lines, your lies. Feeling like a hand in rusted chains. So do you laugh at those who cry? Reply, leaving on a Southern train only yesterday, you lied promises of what I seem to be only watch the time go by all of these things you said to me you lied goodbye goodbye goodbye